Um, the next speaker is somebody that's very special to my heart. She's uh, one of my very best friends. And um, while we were fishing, we all have nicknames, and we always nicknamed her Pocahontas for obvious reasons. She's absolutely beautiful. Um, Janice Senyu is here to share her story after discovering her Métis heritage and embracing that heritage. Janice, do you want to come tell us your story? Good afternoon, my Métis journey. I began this journey of researching my ancestry as a tribute to my father, John Richard Roberts, better known as Jake Roberts, who passed away in 1997. When we were growing up, he always told us we were Aboriginal, and he always wanted to prove it, so I set out on my journey to honour him. With the help of my good friend Barb Manson, I was able to collect local historical documentation, like Lake of the Woods Cemetery records and local newspaper articles, which led me to the Manitoba Genealogical Society in Winnipeg. From there, I accessed Manitoba Church records for baptismal and marriage certificates, which helped me trace my ancestry all the way back prior to 1810. Although the census records from my earlier ancestors did not include birth dates, I discovered that they were as far away as Northwest Territories. In all these documents, my ancestors were listed as Métis, or in some instances, half-breed. In the early years, my ancestors were residents of Manitoba, around the Selkirk area. In 1890, my great-great-grandparents, Joseph and Jane Harper, moved from Selkirk to Rat Portage with their family, which included three daughters and two sons, one of whom was my great-grandfather, Peter Harper. Great-great-grandfather Joseph passed away at the age of 79 in 1937. His obituary in the local newspaper stated that he was a pioneer resident of Kenora, coming here some 47 or 48 years ago to reside. He was a contractor by trade. His wife Jane passed away in 1936. Both were Métis. I am truly honoured that two of my great-great-grandparents were recognised as pioneers of the Rat Portage Kenora area. What a great choice they made in moving here. Our family have been residents here ever since. My great-grandfather, Peter Harper, was four years old when his parents made the move to Rat Portage. He eventually met and married Elizabeth Jane Sabiston. They had two sons and three daughters, one of whom was my grandmother, Myrtle Irene. Peter was an electrician by trade and worked for the town of Kenora for 45 years. Upon his death, he was listed as the oldest town employee. My great-grandmother, Elizabeth, passed away at the age of 86 in 1967 in Kenora. This is a picture of their wedding photos. Uh, my sister still has them in the original frames with the original beveled glass. They're absolutely stunning in person. My grandmother, Myrtle Irene Harper, met and married my grandfather, John Edward Roberts, who was of English descent. They had two sons, John, better known as Jake, and George. Jake was my father. His mother, Myrtle, passed away in 1951 when my dad was 10 years old. She died of breast cancer. This was a very devastating time for all. My dad told stories that he was not allowed to go see his mother in the hospital as she was too sick, so he climbed the wall of the local hospital to get in, into her room through a window. I'm sure glad times have changed. And as a side note, I was just in Calgary two weeks ago and visited my uncle. And he had just prior, um, he was given photos from his estranged stepsister, which included a picture of my grandmother Myrtle and my grandfather, their wedding photo, and that's the first photo I have ever seen of my grandmother. Unfortunately, the death of my grandmother Myrtle meant that the passing of our history and traditions to my father ended. I wish my dad would have learned more about our past, or if he did, I wish he would have shared it with my sister and me. Years ago, it was encouraged that you hide your ancestry rather than accept you were Aboriginal. Due to this, we never grew up knowing any of our Métis traditions and cultures. We lost our sense of family identity. 
my parents, Jake Roberts and Charlotte. This is a picture of my dad and my uncle George is the young one. My parents, Jake Roberts and Charlotte Snyder, met and married in 1963. They had two daughters, Natalie and me. My mother passed away in 1993 and my father in 1997. As part of my research, I asked my uncle George if he could remember any stories from when he was growing up. He shared that his aunt Edith Morton, Nee Harper, the sister of his mother, was proud of our Indian identity. She always reminded me of our heritage and claimed we were closer to the land than others. It was from her that I, George, found out I was Métis. My mom died when I was five, so she wasn't able to share those memories with me. My aunt, Pat Marshall, was dark-skinned with flashing brown eyes and gorgeous black hair. Because of her looks, she was called a squaw at times. Ironically, her sister, Aunt Mavis, was blonde and blue-eyed. Métis means mixed blood or mixed ancestry in French. It is generally thought that the first Métis came into being about 1650 as British and French traders moved to the Great Lakes in search of beaver pelts. These adventurers soon met indigenous people with, and their children became the first Métis. They were the descendants of Cree, Nakota, and Ojibwe women and mainly French and Scottish Canadians. The Métis were the lifeblood of the West. They contributed to the fur trade as trappers, guides, interpreters, factors, voyageurs, and boat operators. They actually invented the York boat, which was essential to the fur trade. They also created the ingenious jigger fishing used to set nets under the ice. Métis were recognized as one of Canada's indigenous peoples under the Constitution Act of 1982, and again in 2003 by the Supreme Court. There are only three recognized indigenous peoples in Canada, Inuit, Métis, and First Nations. Then, in 2016, the Supreme Court ruled that Métis and non-status Indians were all considered Indians. This decision established the federal government must accept responsibility for negotiating programs and services for the Métis community. All of my relatives grew up in the rideout area of town, as did we. I wonder if our relatives went to Lakeside. I remember as a young girl walking down the back lane to the great Aunt Edie's house. She always had a great big smile on her face and welcomed us in the house with a great big hug. Then we would go up the street to Great Uncle Abe and Great Auntie Lil's place. Great Auntie Lil would make the best homemade French fries cooked in pure lard. I don't know how Uncle Abe stayed so slim as Auntie Lil was an amazing cook. I remember Uncle Abe with his stunning white hair and dark skin. We didn't have much family around us growing up, but I sure have fond memories of those two homes. I wish they were still around so I could ask questions about our ancestry. I have fond memories of going snowmobiling with my dad when I was very small. We would stop and he would make a campfire and cook bannock on a stick. We would put jam on it and eat it every, and enjoy every mouthful. At that point in my life, I never really thought much about it, why he made it who taught him to make it, and what it really meant to him. As the years passed, he didn't do it anymore, and I'm not sure why. Maybe Dad buried his own ancestry in order to fit in with society, or his culture that he did learn as a child was just lost over the years. My mom and Dad were avid fishermen, and we would go out every week, sometimes a couple of times, winter or summer. I think my sister and I went from holding a baby bottle to holding a fishing rod. My parents would give our neighbors freshly clean fish. It was the job of my sister and me to deliver the fish to the neighbors, who were always so appreciative. To this day, my husband Dan and I still like to give fish to people who cannot get out on the water to enjoy a day of fishing. We had one lady who cried when she saw the bag of fish we were giving her, stating she hadn't had it in years. Sometimes we take it for granted how good our fish really is. I think fishing is in our blood our Métis blood. My dad always provided for our family as much as he could by living off the land. He always had a beautiful garden with fresh vegetables. He fished summer and winter. He hunted ducks and geese and larger game like moose. But he said, once you pull that trigger, all the fun was over. 
He was a butcher by trade and worked on the side cutting up people's kills and made the best sausage in the world. Oh, to taste his sausage again would be amazing. My dad was a deadly accurate shot. He took Dan, at that point my boyfriend, out duck hunting one morning. They left at 3.30 a.m. They were heading out to his hunting spot down Rush Bay Road, and he asked Dan if he wanted breakfast. Dan was excited and said, sure, knowing that my mom was an awesome cook. My dad pulled the truck over and went to the back. Then he cracked two beer. Well, that was breakfast. <laughs> they continued on to the duck blind. They were sitting quietly with their guns across their laps, waiting for ducks to fly in. All of a sudden, a couple of teals came flying in. My dad stood up. Before Dan knew what was going on, two quick shots and two ducks down. My dad sat down with his gun across his lap like nothing ever happened. Another time when they went hunting, they went hunting for Canada geese. They were very successful and brought the birds home for a so-called delicious meal. My dad taught, my dad taught Dan how to take the feathers off the goose and how to clean it. My mom cooked it and it smelled delicious. With my first bite, I hit a pellet and almost cracked my tooth. Well, that was the end of my meal and I have never put a piece of goose in my mouth since. I worked for the Ministry of Solicitor General and recently retired with over 35 years service. As part of identifying myself as Métis at work, I was able to participate in Aboriginal gatherings that the Ministry would hold once a year. They would bring all the First Nations, Métis and Inuit employees together to discuss issues like racism in the workplace, learning opportunities and healing processes. I was so nervous to attend my first gathering. First Nations people from Northern Ontario are very distinct in their looks, dark hair, darker skin. I thought, would I be the only blonde woman in the room? And wonder, what would people think of me? Would people say I didn't belong? I walked in the room for the first time, and lo and behold, there were lots of blonde hair, fair-skinned people in the room. I did breathe a sigh of relief. I think the most memorable guest speaker we had was Ovid Mercredi. Since I am early for everything, I was, one, I was one of the first to arrive and took a seat at the table near the front of the room. Then this gentleman came up to me and said I was in his seat. I apologized and was going to move, and he said, oh, he was just kidding. He sat down beside me, and we talked and laughed for a while until the gathering commenced. We hadn't introduced ourselves at that point. The next thing I knew, he was called up to speak. He was such a captivating speaker with a tremendous sense of humor. I took a six-week course through the local Métis Nation of Ontario office on Michif, which is the Métis language, and considered an endangered language. It is a mixture of French, Cree, and Ojibwe. It was very good, but unfortunately, if you don't keep speaking a language that you're learning, you forget most of it. The most I can remember from the course was Tanshikia, which means how are you, and Nimiyawayu, I am fine, and Nokum, because I'm a grandmother of four. At the end of the course, we had a traditional feast, and I was presented with my Métis sash, which I truly treasure. During this course, we were given a disc of sayings that we could practice in preparation for the following week's class. I had it in my car in the disc player and would listen to it driving back and forth to work. My son borrowed my car. When he started at the vehicle up, the disc started playing. He said, what are you listening to? Are you crazy? I simply stated, your heritage. One of the benefits of the Métis status is pride in your ancestral native grandmothers. Métis status is accomplished by tracing your ancestry back about 100 years or four to six generations. The official Métis language is French Cree. Of the people who identify themselves as Métis, 84.5% live in either the Western provinces or Ontario. 21.4% live in Alberta. In 2011, 451,795 people were identified as Métis. To be accepted by the Métis Nation, you must self-identify as Métis. Sometimes you feel caught between two cultures, but also a part of a culture unique to itself. The Métis flag, created in 1814, shows a white infinity symbol on a field of either blue or red. The infinity symbol has two meanings, faith that the Métis culture will live on forever and 
the mixing of European immigrants and First Nations people. Métis traditions include fiddle playing, folk songs, folk tales, crafts such as beading, and of course, the Métis sash. The, saf, the sas, sash serves many purposes, key holder, first aid kit, washcloth, towel, and at times an emergency brindle or saddle blanket. The traditional men's clothing consists of deerskin pants, leggings, moccasins, and a long hooded coat called a capote fastened with a sash. Women wore simple dresses with high necklines, often with shawls and moccasins. I did forget to show you one picture. This is a picture of my mom and dad, my sister and me. Many years ago, my dad nicknamed me Pumpkin, but I think it was because I had a pumpkin-shaped head. Métis values include healthy competition, hard work, and persistence. With these values, I hope to be able to continue to learn more about our Métis heritage and to be able to pass this on to my children and my grandchildren so that they can be as proud of their heritage as I am. There is a kind of beauty in reaching back to where your roots come from. I am very proud to say I am Métis. Marcy, thank you.